Hello, everyone. This is Brandon Finnegan, uh, co-founder of Decision Desk HQ, with another edition, of course, of our YouTube series. I am joined today by Catherine Swartz of Notice and a fellow DDHQer, Zachary Donany, who is our one of our data science people, one of the whizzes behind that handles all that stuff and looks at the numbers and tries to figure out what they mean. Uh, we'll get right into things, I think, with at the very start with our latest polling averages we have over at the Hill and uh, Decision Desk HQ, the state of play of the presidential race. Here's a surprise. It's close. And the national picture, Harris still has a slightly less close marginal lead over Donald Trump, pulling at about 49.2 over 45.6 in the national average. But when we start to look down to the states that matter, of course, those swing states, they are all very, very tight. Current polling average has a negligible tenth of a percent lead for Harris in Arizona, a equally negligible 0.4 percent lead for, in, for Harris in Georgia, uh, again, equally negligible 0.6% lead for her in Nevada. Uh, another marginal lead for her in, Phil in uh, Pennsylvania by about 0.7%. And slightly larger leads in Michigan of about a point and a half. Wisconsin about 34 So again, since the end of the convention, since Labor Day, we've kind of seen things tight. Tight everywhere, tight in all the states that matter. Uh, effectively toss-ups here or there. And anyone that tries to read into, oh, it went from a half a point to a point or a point to half a point, we're talking things that are so incredibly tiny. They, they don't mean anything for an election that's 60 days out. However, uh, it's right where everyone kind of assumed it would be once we saw the switch up between Biden and Harris, and she was able to bring everybody into the party, so to speak, everyone that had been kind of been disaffected with Biden on the Democratic side, just kind of locked a lot of those voters up. And right now it's just neck and neck for uh, Vice President Kamala Harris and former President Donald Trump. Talking about this picture, again, the tightest states that we see here, Pennsylvania, both candidates are actively campaigning here. It, it is a priority state for both of them. Georgia, tight as a tick. Nevada, tight as a tick. North Carolina, tight as a tick. Right? These are states that we would expect to be close. Right. And that again, there was conversation earlier in the cycle about other states potentially coming on the board. And they were very much so on the board with uh, President Joe Biden, but they don't appear to be at this time. We'll go through a real rundown of what you both think about the latest numbers and where the state of play is. And we'll move on from there. So I will start with our data science guy. Zachary, what do you take on? What's your take on everything right now? I think with the current battleground where everything is really, really close and it's going to be hard for either candidate to sweep all six or seven battleground states, it makes Pennsylvania really, really important. And specifically, there are kind of these two key scenarios that get the candidate to exactly 270 electoral votes, the minimum amount they need to win. And uh, for, for Harris, that scenario would be winning uh, Michigan, Wisconsin, and Pennsylvania. Even if she loses all four Sunbelt states, she gets to exactly 270. For Trump, it would be holding his map from 2020 and then flipping Pennsylvania and Georgia, which get him to exactly 270. And Pennsylvania is worth more electoral votes than any of these other states. So kind of for both for both Harris and Trump, it's either you have to win Pennsylvania or you have to win, you know, a couple other states and go, you know, four out of five of the other non-Pennsylvania states, which with everything so close, just kind of strikes me as a big left. I uh, tend to agree, but I think anyone that's watched this series or has followed me on Twitter and has followed my thoughts on the state of Pennsylvania for the last 10 years would know that, of course, Pennsylvania is the most important state. It is the largest state. Like you just said, it's 19 electoral votes right there. And that is why we are seeing a disproportionate amount of money, time and energy invested in Pennsylvania. It is a little interesting. Like, yes, there's other swing states that are receiving considerable influxes of cash and personnel from both campaigns. But I'm trying to think of the last time I watched an election where one state was quite clearly the state everybody wanted to look at uh, to this degree. You'd have to probably go back to uh, Florida in 2000, Ohio in 2004 for it to really come down to a state. And it may very well come down to that state again. Uh, Catherine, thoughts? I mean, I completely agree with you, Brandon. Uh, listeners of this show are really going to think I'm sounding like a broken record when I say that Pennsylvania is going to be 
uh, arguably the most crucial swing state here. Uh, it's clear from the amount of time being spent there that that's the case. And just one stat to point to you, uh, the Trump campaign has put $70 million in ad buys in Pennsylvania. That's more than the other top six swing states combined. So looking just at the numbers of ads, uh, it's clear the Trump campaign, as I've reported on before, uh, is putting their eggs in Pennsylvania. But just like on those polling numbers, again, when it comes to Pennsylvania and the other swing states, uh, I think it's important to remember uh, the debate on Tuesday. Uh, all eyes are on that debate. That debate will be in Philadelphia. Uh, of course, Pennsylvania uh, being a key point here again. Uh, but when looking at those numbers and looking uh, of the amount that could or couldn't change, uh, I think eyes are set towards Tuesday. I would tend to agree. To wrap this up, I would like to point out the fact, because I've talked about this in previous episodes, I don't look at margins. I look at vote share for candidates. And it is interesting that in the case of Donald Trump, his vote share in Pennsylvania is much closer to the Sun Belt states than it is to the Midwestern states. Um, he's pulling at about 46, and then the average in Wisconsin, a little bit tick better in Michigan. He's at 47 and a half, which is far closer to his vote share in Nevada, Arizona, and Georgia, and North Carolina. So it, we might actually see a real crack up. People weren't expecting the, those three states, uh, Michigan, Wisconsin, and Pennsylvania, to break apart. In fact, we haven't seen that happen uh, in a considerable amount of time. The last election where Michigan and Pennsylvania uh, two of those three states broke and broke one way, and the third state broke another. Was in 1988 when Wisconsin voted for Dukakis, but Michigan and Pennsylvania both voted for H. W. Bush. All right, so let's kind of move over to the uh, the Senate picture. I know Zachary, we, we kind of talked about this. You seem to be pretty uh, you have, have a lot of thoughts on the state of play in the U.S. Senate, the race for control of the U.S. Senate. Yeah, I, I think uh, so. To to recap. Democrats need to win a lot of races to win the Senate. They need to get to 50 seats, even if they win the presidency. And that means sweeping every conventional battleground state and winning two out of Ohio, Montana, Texas, and Florida, which is a big lift. They're polling well in Ohio. So if they want to be very optimistic there, you have to think that the really big lift is winning one out of Montana, Texas, and Florida. And yeah, those three states are all states that Donald Trump is is heavily favored in. I think, you know, e even Kamala's campaign would say that she's probably an underdog in those three states. So these Senate candidates are going to have to overperform Kamala. And uh, I, as I've been thinking about recently, I mean, Democrats are sitting at zero dollars in post-Labor Day ad reservations in, in Texas and Florida Senate races as of a few days ago. If, if uh, Rehearsal Powell and Colin Allred are going to outrun Kamala, in those states, you think they have to define their image more positively. And then in, in Montana, where hardened Democratic incumbent John Tester is going up against uh, Tim Sheehy, uh, the last two polls have been bad for Tester. Uh, a poll just released for uh, by uh, Fabrizio and Ward for AARP has Tester losing by six to Sheehy already. And uh, this is usually the spot in the cycle when these incumbents like Tester are, are polling well before they so often start uh, overperforming the top of the ballot by less down the stretch and then often even underperform polls on election day because split ticket voting is, is going down in presidential years. Uh, Catherine, any thoughts on the state of play with the Senate? Yeah, really, when it comes to these races, uh, I think especially in Ohio, uh, Montana as well, this is the case, although Ohio is seen uh, by strategists as the, the more likely of the two between Ohio and Montana to stay in Democratic control. But it really comes down to that number of ticket splitters, like you mentioned. Uh, it's a race presidentially. Uh, the, the campaign does not have their sights on. But Sherrod Brown having the advantage here over those races, Florida and Texas, you mentioned, uh, where there's a huge gap in terms of name recognition, in terms of getting the candidate out there uh, because they haven't been a sitting U.S. Senator. Sherry Brown, wildly popular in the state, uh, high favorability among Democrats, among independent voters. Uh, he's done that before uh, in his reelection, but uh, what it comes down to is the changing dynamic politically uh, and just how many ticket splitters are in there in that key state, I think is the question that remains in control. And talking about ticket splitting, my own home state of Maryland is, is kind of an amusing part of this whole election. You know, you have former Governor Larry Hogan running against um, 
PG County Executive Angela Alsobrooks, and everyone just assumed this race was eventually going to snap into Alsobrooks extraordinarily favored. And while, yes, every model, every assessment of that race tends to put it at the best likely Democratic, and by the best, I mean best for Hogan, likely Democratic, we can't ignore the polling. And we've had two polls that have been released in the last week, one of which had them tied at 46 apiece, one which was a 46 to 41 lead um, for Alsobrooks. This isn't the same picture that we see with the presidential election here. We know that Kamala Harris is going to win in Maryland by a massive margin. She is going to win by 30 points or more here. And so Hogan has an, a massive headwind that he has to run against. For him to even poll in the 40s is pretty incredible. And I would actually make a prediction that while I do not expect Hogan to win, I would expect to see more money spent by the Democratic Party in Maryland than we're going to see for the Senate race in Florida. When everything is settled, it would not shock me if there is considerable more money invested by Democrats, by Democratic-affiliated groups and PACs in the state of Maryland than in Florida, because frankly, it's not that Angela Alsobrooks, they, they probably don't believe she could lose in the end because the ticket splitting. It's such a big gap. For Hogan to win, he would have to overperform to a degree that we haven't seen since Joe Manchin in 2012. Still, it's going to be a thorn in the side of the Democratic Party because that's money that they would rather invest in other states that they're going to have to spend in Maryland. So um, I, I think I'm where Zach is on Zachary is on, you know, the state of play of the states. I think you'd have to say the Republicans are favored to be at about 51, 52 seats when everything settles after November. So with the Senate kind of wrapped and again, not as many seats, they're always the big, you know, the upper house. It's a big deal. But of course, there's a whole lot more seats that are discussed at the other house. The U.S. House, the House of Representatives, right? So, Catherine, I'm going to kick this over to you to lead the discussion on the state of play with the uh, House of Representatives. What's going on here? Yeah, well, control of the House is top of my mind right now because uh, House uh, lawmakers will come back next week to Washington. They've been out of town for six weeks, out on the campaign trail in these vulnerable races. But now it's time to get back to work uh, and they've got to fund the government and they've got about a month to do it. And uh, House Speaker Mike Johnson is looking to put um, the SAVE Act, which is an act that would require uh, proof of citizenship when registering to vote. He wants to attach that to a bill to fund the government. Uh, and vulnerable, uh, moderate Republicans in the House are getting pretty concerned about uh, the odds of having that combined package. Now, to be clear, that wouldn't go anywhere in the Senate, and it certainly wouldn't go anywhere under President Biden. Uh, but it is a sign uh, for voters in these uh, most vulnerable districts uh, with these Republican members. Uh, you're looking at New York and California in particular that, hey, if that lawmaker, if the messaging there is that they are in some way responsible for either the threat of a shutdown uh, or for this bill that they see as unfavorable, uh, that's a vulnerability that's coming right as mail-in voting is starting to happen. So again, like I mentioned, it's New York and California. Uh, really fascinating because some of these key Senate races, you're looking at Pennsylvania, uh, Wisconsin, Michigan, those line up with the swing states, which means all the money is being funneled into there into coordinated offices. But in those two states, you've got absolutely no uh, presidential kind of uh, serious campaigning. California, there's a Senate race that is uh, certainly going to uh, at Democrat Adam Schiff there, current House representative. Uh, so the, the markets in these two states are huge as well. It's more expensive races, and that makes things uh, tricky for fundraising and campaigning. Uh, so just want to flag as well that uh, the Harris campaign has just put $10 million uh, into the DCCC uh, to defending those races after uh, a major fundraising haul. Uh, but with the House coming back and with the map being what it is uh, in the House, you are certainly looking at uh, what will be a bitter fight uh, for the House majority, one that is really separate in a lot of ways from the presidential and Senate races. Uh, Zachary, your thoughts? Yeah, I mean, I, I agree. It's super interesting. I think in 2022, Republican gains ended up being much more concentrated in New York and California than a lot of people thought. Kathy Hochul uh, only won by single digits in the New York gubernatorial race. She lost a lot of key districts and her coattails dragged down Democrats across the state. In California, Newsom won by a much healthier margin, but he still was losing a lot of key House districts. Like I think he lost California 13 in the Central Valley, a district that uh, Hillary, Biden and Obama all won by double digits. So because of this dynamic, it's very interesting because, yeah, we're seeing so many uh, Democrats playing offense 
in these pretty blue districts in these pretty blue states, uh, seeing if they can flip uh, uh, from the Republican incumbents. And as you said, a lot of these Republican incumbents are, are, are very are very moderate. I think Republicans have had you know a bit of an issue with candidate quality throughout the past four to six years and have blown some Senate seats, some House districts. But when you look at guys like David Valadao, John Duarte, Mike Lawler, uh, Anthony Despacito, you know, they're, they're very, uh, they're more and more moderate guys who uh, you know, stuck with McCarthy for a while, have opposed the Freedom Caucus, and then maybe the type of Republicans who can overperform just like, you know, Hester and Manchin did for Democrats and then and, and help win them the House this November. And Zachary, just to jump in, uh, because you mentioned uh, California 13 and John Duarte, uh, I just had a, a piece that came out earlier this week that was examining that district on the Central Valley races, looking at exactly that. You have a much more moderate Republican versus a much more moderate Democrat, uh, and what role uh, the political ideology is playing in kind of these two areas uh, when it comes to those moderate candidates. You know, I think this kind of some gives a good summary of the state of play right now. We are officially after Labor Day. This is the time I, we, I've been telling people, everyone's been talking about, start looking at the polling now, start looking and seeing how voters are paying attention. Summer is long over. We've got our candidates, they're settled. They've been they've been, received their nominations from their parties formally, and they debate Tuesday night on September the 10th. And uh, also on September the 10th, to plug this, Decision Desk HQ will be providing live election results for the primaries in Delaware, Rhode Island, and of course, New Hampshire. New Hampshire has a competitive gubernatorial election in November. We get to see who the candidates will be from their respective parties Tuesday night. You can follow all of the latest results and analysis of everything you need, all your election needs, you can find at our homepage, decisiondeskhq.com. For Catherine Swartz, for Zachary Donini, and for myself, I want to thank you all for watching, and we'll see you again.